Welcome back. So now we've learned how to measure LV and RV size and function. It's now time to learn to assess cardiac valves. We'll start with the mitral valve. The mitral valve separates the left atrium and ventricle and is visible in many of the standard views. The first step of assessing the mitral valve is to examine the appearance of the valve in 2D. A normal valve should look like this. This is the anterior leaflet and this is the posterior leaflet. The leaflets should be thin, thinner than 5 millimeters, and we can measure that using the caliper after freezing the image. Uh, they should also have free mobility on the ventricular side, but should not cross the plane of the mitral annulus on the atrial side, as represented by this line drawn by caliper and parasternal long axis. If any portion of the leaflets cross this line, this is called mitral valve prolapse. The leaflets should also meet at the tips during systole. This is called normal coaptation. An abnormal mitral valve can be due to rheumatic heart disease, degenerative valvular heart disease, also called sclerocalcific valvular heart disease, or mitral valve prolapse, among others. This here is an example of a rheumatic mitral valve in parasternal long axis view. As you can see, the leaflets are obviously thickened, and the anterior valve leaflet has restricted mobility at the tip, leading to doming of the anterior valve leaflet in systole, which is actually characteristic of rheumatic heart disease. The uh, posterior leaflet motion is also restricted. It's virtually not moving at all. Uh, it's also notable how the leaflets don't exactly meet at the tips, but rather the tip of one leaflet meets the side of one leaflet. This is called tip to side malcoaptation. Notice also that the cordy tendini and the papillary muscles, what we call the subvalvular apparatus, are thickened. This is another view of uh, a rheumatic mitral valve. In this case, the patient is in atrial fibrillation. You can see how the heart rate is rapid and irregular. Uh, there's also a large atrial thrombus here because of the atrial fibrillation. Uh, if we take a still image of this sequence, uh, you'll see also, again, the systolic doming of the anterior mitral valve leaflet in a characteristic pattern that we call the hockey stick deformation because the leaflet kind of resembles a hockey stick. This is an example of a valve with degenerative valvular heart disease or sclerocalcific valvular heart disease. It usually happens with uh, age, but in the case of this patient, it, it, he's, this patient is a chronic kidney disease patient and in these patients, sclerocalcific damage to the valves happens early on because of calcium deposition in, in, in the tissues, especially the valves. So uh, you can again see how the leaflets are thickened and calcified, uh, as evidenced by this big chunk of calcium on the valve. Uh, leaflet motion is also severely restricted, and, and this valve is, is actually severely stenotic. This is an example of a patient with mitral valve prolapse. Let's, let's take a still image of this. Remember the annular plane line that we discussed before? This is it again, drawn from the basis of the two leaflets. And it's easy to see that the leaflets cross and prolapse beyond this line back into the left atrium. This is a normal valve again, but in a different view, the parasternal short axis view at the mitral valve level. And uh, you can see how the two leaflets are moving well and how the valve area is quite normal. Compare it with this. This is a rheumatic mitral valve with uh, mitral stenosis. And, and you can see how the commissures of the valves are fused at the peripheries, leading to a reduced valve area and, and a fish mouth appearance, as we call it, of the mitral valve. The next step of assessing the mitral valve is to look at it using color Doppler. This is, again, a normal valve in apical four-chamber view. And it's also easy to see how both leaflets are, are mobile and pliable. Compare it with this, a rheumatic mitral valve. Leaflet motion is restricted, and leaflets are thickened. This is the 2D appearance of the valve. The next step is to use color Doppler to assess blood flow across the valve. This is an example of color Doppler over a normal mitral valve in apical four chamber view. There's only a very trivial jet of mitral regurgitation, which is acceptable. And uh, 
diastolic flow is normal. Compare it with this. In, in diastole, there is a, a flame-shaped jet, which indicates turbulent bl blood flow. And this, this appearance is commonly observed in patients with mitral stenosis. You can see the aliasing, which, which uh, means all these melange of, of colors, the green and, and yellow and red. And, and this means turbulent blood flow. This is another color shot of, uh, of a mitral valve showing an abnormal jet of blood flow from the LV back into the left atrium. This is called mitral regurgitation or mitral incompetence or mitral insufficiency. So now that we've learned to uh, spot mitral stenosis and mitral regurg regurgitation, the next step is to determine the grade or the severity of stenosis or, or of regurgitation. Let's start with regurgitation. This is an example of a normal valve showing trivial mitral regurgitation and as we said trivial MR is acceptable and is normal. There it is. This is an example of mild MR. There are several criteria that we use to judge the severity of regurgitation um, and there are even ways to estimate the volume of the regurgitated blood but we're going to keep it simple. Some simple criteria are jet length, jet area compared to left atrial area and vena contracta. As we said, this is an example of mild MR. Let's take a still photo of that. You do that by freezing the image and using the trackball if necessary to track to the shot where the regurgitation is at its most. Jet area, jet length is small and jet area is less than 20% of the left atrial area. You can just judge that by look or use the area feature like we did in RV fractional area change. Vena contracta means measuring the diameter of the narrowest part of the jet or as we call it the neck of the jet. Uh, we measure it using caliper after freezing the image of course and tracking to the part where the neck of the jet is most visible. This is the vena contracta here in this case, and mild MR has a vena contracta of less than 3 millimeters. This is an example of moderate MR. Again, let's take a still image. Jet length is longer, and the jet fills more than 20% of the left atrial, left atrial area. And, and if we measure the vena contracta, it's measured right here at the tips of the leaflet, it will lie between 0.3 and 0.6 millimeters. In this case, 0.5 millimeters. This is an example of severe MR. Let's take a still image of that. Severe MR has a much longer jet length, usually. The regurgitant area, or the jet area, is more than 40% of the left atrial area, and the vena contracta, when measured, is 0.7 millimeters or higher, 0.9 in this case. Other clues indicating the presence of severe MR are swirling of blood in the left atrium, as you can see in this case, and reflux of the blood into the pulmonary veins, visible down here in epical fourth chamber view. You can, you can also make sure using pulsed wave Doppler placed at the mouth of a pulmonary vein and presence of flow below the baseline in systole means regurgitation into the pulmonary veins, which is consistent with severe MR. Another important sign in severe MR is a dilated LV, although this happens in long-standing MR and not in acute cases. There is a special type of MR that I'd like to know uh, that I'd like you to know about, which is called functional MR. Uh, functional MR, this is an example of functional MR. Functional MR is MR that happens in the absence of any valve pathology, but is due to marked LV dilatation which deforms the mitral annulus or pulls on the cordy tendini, interfering with proper leaflet closure. This is an example of functional MR, as you said, and you can see how the valve leaflets look normal. Okay, so uh, what does it mean for you when your patient has severe MR? Well, MR increases as systemic blood pressure increases because in that case there is more resistance to forward flow and the blood takes the easy way out back into the atrium and through that to the pulmonary circulation. So in patients with severe MR you need to tightly control blood pressure at target values even lower than usual and you need to use vasodilators to increase forward flow.
Okay, so that was regurgitation. Now let's move on to mitral stenosis. Stenosis means a narrow valve area which causes obstruction to blood flow and high pressure gradient across the valve. The first clue to mitral stenosis is a small opening on 2D as we've just seen. The next step is to measure the pressure gradients and the valve area. Pressure gradients across the mitral valve are measured using continuous wave Doppler in the apical fourth chamber view. Let's position the cursor now across the mitral valve opening and press CW. We press freeze now. And uh, this is an example of a normal continuous wave Doppler trace on the mitral valve. This is flow above the baseline, so it's flow toward the probe, that is to say from the LA to the LV, which is the normal direction of blood flow across the mitral valve. Uh, and what, what phase of the cardiac cycle does that happen? Yep, diastole, when ventricular filling occurs. To measure the pressure gradient, bring up the measurement pane, select mitral valve, go to mitral valve VTI. Sometimes it's going to be called mitral valve trace depending on your machine. Select uh, an envelope, which is uh, clear enough, and start out at the beginning of this envelope. Press the left mouse button and trace, trace it like this. This is called the E wave, and this little wave is called the A wave, for A contraction. OK, and press the end. So the Vmax is called the maximum velocity. The Vmean is the mean velocity. The max PG is the peak gradient. And the mean PG is the mean pressure gradient across the mitral valve. The VTI is, is called the velocity time integral. Just forget about that for now. Let's just focus on the mean gradient. As you've guessed, the mean gradient is the, the average overall gradient for the whole M envelope while the, the, the maximum or peak gradient is the, the topmost point in the envelope. Uh, a normal mean gradient is below 2 millimeters mercury. A mean gradient above 10 millimeters mercury is consistent with severe mitral stenosis. A gradient below 5 is mild stenosis and in between is moderate. There's one important thing that you have to keep in mind though. In the case of atrial fibrillation, which very often coexists with mitral stenosis being actually secondary to it, the envelopes will be variable in size, like this, with the vari with larger ones occurring after longer pauses. This is an example of, of, of continuous wave mitral inflow in an atrial fibrillation patient. Notice how the envelope is single peaked as opposed to the normal double peak due to the loss of the atrial kick. Uh, there's just an E, an e wave, there's no A wave. Uh, now, uh, which of these do we measure? The ideal answer is all of the above. Well, actually five of them. You should measure five beats and average them, avoiding outliers. You don't need to do all that though if the valve is obviously non-stenotic. The next way to quantify stenosis is to calculate the valve area. There are several methods of doing that and we'll be discussing two of them. You should always do both to make sure. The first method is valve planimetry and this is the standard and usually the most accepted method. Remember that parasternal short axis mitral valve level view of that rheumatic mitral valve with the fish mouth appearance? That's the view we use to measure valve area. Let me just point out that, again, we don't measure valve area unless the valve looks suspicious of being stenosed. A valve with the uh, clearly well opening leaflets in 2D doesn't need its area measured. Anyway, let's get back to that view. What you want to do is keep tilting the probe up and down until you can see the narrowest aperture. R remember that you're imaging a 3D structure and a stenotic mitral valve looks like a cone, which you're trying to cut in cross section. So you keep looking until you find a cut on the apex of that cone. So if, as you see in this example, the cut is away from the apex and the mi mitral valve area will look deceivingly normal. If, if we tilt the probe to move the plane forwards a little bit, we get a little closer to the apex. We're still not at the apex and the valve area will still look higher than real area. This is the correct plane at which we're supposed to cut the mitral valve, and this is the cut that will give us the real mitral valve area. Anyway, let's get back to that view. What you want to do is keep tilting the probe up and down until you can see the narrowest aperture. Freeze the image, 
use the trackball to track back to the valve when it's maximally open in this view. Okay, so this would be it. Now bring up the analysis or measurement panel, go to valves, mitral valve area. We use that in the RU fractional area chain, if you remember. Now start, click the left mouse button or, or the left trackball button anywhere along the opening of the valve and start tracing the valve area. Trying to keep to the border as best as you can and going into all the nooks and crannies. So, okay. There we have it. The mitral valve area is four centimeters square. Normal mitral valve area ranges from four centimeters square to six centimeters square. A valve area below one centimeter square is consistent with severe mitral stenosis. An area above 1.5 centimeter is mild stenosis, and anything between is moderate. Another way to estimate mitral valve area is pressure half time. Let's go back to that mitral valve continuous wave Doppler trace we saved, and the same one we used to estimate the pressure gradients. Bring up the measurements pane again, go to mitral valve, mitral valve pressure half time. Now, as usual, select a clear cut envelope, mark the top with the left trackball button, and then you have this other cursor connected to the first cursor with a line, and you need to align that with the edge of the slope until you reach the baseline. Then mark it again. And you have the pressure half time, 50 millisec milliseconds, and, and the mitral valve area estimated according to this pressure half time, and it's 4.4 centimeters square, and that is consistent with what we measured with planimetry. The machine will perform this calculation for you and give you the estimated value of four, and this is pretty close to the value we, have, we got by planimetry, so that means we did a good job. You should always make sure your data fits together if it doesn't make sense. Uh, if, for example, the gradients are really high, but planimetry gives a normal valve area, then you probably did it wrong. Go back and find the narrowest part of the cone and measure it again. So now your patient has severe MS. What does that mean for you? It means that you should keep the heart rate down, because rapid heart rates mean shorter diastole and less time available for filling, which is already reduced. It also means that your patient could easily develop pulmonary congestion, in which case you're probably going to need to use diuretics. I know this lecture was a little dense. Feel free to go over it one more time if you like, and I'll see you in the next lecture, Assessment of the Aortic Valve.